Tonight, a former elder at Poundmaker Lodge in Alberta is charged with sexual and indecent assaults. It is you know, somewhat of a game changer. Plus, a COVID outbreak is declared in Ganawage country, including the Delta variant of concern. To us, this is the last option. We really hope that we don't have to use this. And an emergency shelter is set up in Winnipeg to hold fire evacuees. Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. We start tonight with breaking news out of St. Albert, Alberta. Our, our reporter Kathleen Martins has an exclusive story. RCMP have charged a former spiritual advisor and elder with sexual assault. Kathleen joins me now to break it down. Hi Kathleen, let's just start at the beginning and why don't you tell us about this case? For sure, hi Daryl. So, you know, this uh, case broke up open on Facebook last December. A woman whose sister was in residential treatment at the Poundmakers Lodge Healing Center in St. Albert posted some disturbing comments on her Facebook page about inappropriate behavior she was alleging by an elder, a man who was hired to be a spiritual advisor. And this uh, facility is located just outside Edmonton in uh, St. Albert. Now, like you had just mentioned, you spoke to some of his alleged victims at the lodge in December. What did they say happened? Right. So, and I should note that the lodge acted quickly after learning of the allegations on Facebook and terminated uh, this man's contract. So he no longer works there. And um, now these were young women, First Nations women, who, who were seeking alcohol and drug treatment. They live at the center. And they say that when he was alone with them, they allege that he exposed himself and made other inappropriate comments and suggestions to them. So they contacted RCMP and they also called, called me at APTN. So what charges does he now face and are they in relation to those women? Yes, so a number of uh, women uh, swore complaints to the RCMP and as a result uh, Gerald Two Teeth, he's 52 years old, he's charged with one count of sexual assault and two counts of indecent assault and the reason RCMP issued a warrant for him is because they say they're unable to locate him and they're hoping that uh, through stories, the, the media, the public can help locate him. So how did you find out about this and these charges? Right. Well, I, I stay in touch with people who I've done stories with, and uh, they were asking me if there was any update, if I'd heard any developments. And so I contacted RCMP this morning and was told that the warrant had actually just been entered into the system yesterday. Okay. So what happens now with, with all of this? Right, well, uh, so a warrant is out for uh, Mr. Two Teeth's arrest, and if, uh, if and when he is located, then that would start, uh, you know, the, the criminal justice process where he would, of course, have an opportunity to apply for bail, and uh, then eventually this may end up in a trial, and then uh, the complainants would be able to tell their stories there. Uh, but for now, uh, RCMP are hoping the public can help uh, locate him by, and let them know about it by calling the Morinville RCMP detachment or Crime Stoppers. All right, Kathleen, we'll leave it there. That is APTN's Kathleen Martins joining us. Thanks, Daryl. None of the allegations against Two Teeth have been proven in court. In southwestern Nova Scotia, Mi'kmaq lobster boats were almost lost at sea. The ropes had been cut overnight and the vessels drifted from the wharf. Mi'kmaq fishers fear the violence will get worse. Angel Moore reports. I'm here at Weymouth Wharf, where Sebag and Nagety First Nation lobster harvesters came this morning to check their boats and their lobster catch. This morning at around 7 a.m., Shai Francis said she found about nine Mi'kmaq lobster boats adrift and some of the lobster crates were adrift as well. Come in here seeing that all the non-native boats that weren't cut and just seeing all of our native boats cut, 
That's a racist terrorist act. This ain't um, some random act of violence where some idiot decided to cut all boats clear. She says the ropes were intentionally cut overnight. All the boats were retrieved and the lobster catches were saved. Made me sick to my stomach to come here and realize that all of our boats, not just my boat, but everybody's boat's gone. And this is not just something to do. This is our living. This is pays our bills. This feeds our families. Sebaganagati First Nation is harvesting lobster under their new food, social, and fishery plan. A press statement from Chief Mike Sachs says, after sharing our fishery management plan with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, retaliation and harassment occurs within hours. Francis says, Just thought. You ain't gonna stop us. You ain't gonna prevail. We're stronger. We come out on top regardless. A community lobster giveaway was planned for this week, but is now delayed as the community assesses the damages and losses that have happened. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Weymouth Wharf, Nova Scotia. In Calgary, the Police Hate Crimes and Extremism Unit is investigating a case of arson that took place at the city's residential school memorial. Some shoes and other items were burned, leaving a pile of ashes in the center of the memorial. In a news release, Calgary police say security observed a man through CCTV as he appeared to attempt to light the memorial on fire before fleeing. Police are asking for the public's assistance to locate the man. Kelly Morningbull with Walking With Our Sisters Calgary helps maintain the site. She says the arson is not surprising, but depressing. It really just, you know, solidifies or amplifies that there's still so much work that needs to be done. And, you know, we've only just really scratched the surface of reconciliation. And, it, and you know, some days it feels like we're, you know, elbows deep in it and we're, we're making change. And then something like this happens. Daily COVID-19 cases in Quebec are climbing to highs not seen since May. More than 300 positive cases were confirmed today, shortly before the Quebec government announced it will be using vaccine passports to prevent transmission of the Delta variant. Except it's already made its way into Mohawk communities south of Montreal. Our Lindsay Richardson has more. Several weeks since the Mohawk Council of Ganawage went live with a COVID briefing, but with cases surging in the last week, public safety says it is you know, somewhat of a game changer. Officials have confirmed the COVID-19 Delta variant is now circulating in Ganawage. A council-issued press release confirms at least 14 active cases of COVID-19. Lloyd Phillips did not say how many Delta cases there are in Ganawage, but did say the community now has Quebec's highest per capita rate of Delta variant infections. But this is a stark reminder that COVID is still here, and now the Delta variant is here. and. You know, we, we must remain vigilant. We must uh, understand that uh, as, as normal as things seem to be coming uh, around Slow But Shore, uh, we can't let down our guard. So they're putting their guard back up. Starting Thursday, Ganawage businesses will keep registries for better contact tracing. Masks are now mandatory for outdoor gatherings of unvaccinated or partially vaccinated community members. 66% of Ganawage residents over 18 have received two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. And the pressure is still on. We've talked about um, herd immunity. And we've been trying so hard to try and get our 80% here in Ganawage. But with the Delta variant right now um, going around the country, uh, they're looking at now as possibly needing 95% uh, effective uh, vaccinations to be able to get good herd immunity. Quebec public health data accounts for 378 Delta variant cases province-wide. 300 of those cases emerged within one month. But for Gunawage, keeping the fourth wave at bay starts now. It's important that uh, the community understand that uh, you know, we are in, in somewhat of a, uh, a fragile state. It's an individual decision, but as Gunawage Nono and as Mohawk people, the collective always comes first.
Only 67% of the Quebec population is fully vaccinated, not enough to prevent breakthrough cases. So Premier Francois Legault says the government will soon be enforcing vaccine passports. Those details and possibly more restrictions are expected in the coming days. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. And Canada's chief public health officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, says that COVID-19 booster shots are not off the table. Tam says they're still assessing how long two doses offer protection, and if they do authorize a third dose, it will be a decision based off the latest science. I think that the evidence is still evolving on that front. Uh, we've certainly seen publications from companies even today that, uh, of course, the vaccines had remained quite effective um, for at least six months um, after the initial vaccination. And um, while, of course, we had to take into account the changing uh, variants that are circulating, etc. So it's a, it is a complex discussion. But uh, right now, I think our focus is, um, as we've said, in their opening remarks, getting people their first and second dose for everyone who's eligible. Tam says the government will continue collecting data on breakthrough infections and will wait to see if outbreaks begin to occur in settings like long-term care homes where everyone is fully vaccinated. All right, we have to take a short break, but still ahead, we'll tell you about a couple of funding announcements in Saskatchewan and Alberta. Welcome back. The federal government will be giving funding to the Saskatoon Tribal Council to help run their child and family services back to full capacity. In 2016, the Saskatchewan government took over child welfare programs from the Saskatoon Tribal Council. But in 2019, the Saskatchewan government and the council agreed to work together to bring those services back. Today, the Minister of Indigenous Services, Mark Miller, announced stable funding for three years to build child and family services programs. I just want to announce today our commitment to invest tw over $23 million uh, per year for a total of just shy of $71 million to support the amazing work that you've done. In Edmonton, some good news for low-income families and seniors looking for a better home. The first of four multiplex housing complexes with eight units is ready to move in. Tribal Chiefs Ventures secured funding to build the units from the federal and provincial governments at a cost of $6 million. A total of 32 units will be offered to low-income Indigenous families, seniors, students and individuals. The first people will be moving in this weekend, while the three other multiplexes are expected to be ready by the fall. Tribal Chiefs Ventures CEO Cam Alexis says this is a template for other cities to follow. The Chiefs had a vision with the council, the elders, to start looking at affordable homes in around the city of Edmonton and to try and empower and get our people off the streets. And that is the huge significance of this. More importantly is ownership of affordable homes, ownership of new homes in the city of Edmonton rather than moving into decrepit homes. And this gives people an uh, opportunity to empower themselves, have a sense of ownership. The federal government has settled a class action lawsuit over potable drinking water on reserves. The deal would be worth nearly $8 billion and $1.5 billion will compensate more than 140,000 people who had to consume unsafe water. Stephanie Wilsey is part of the legal team that worked on the deal and she joins us now. Stephanie, thanks for joining us. How important is this settlement for four First Nations across the country that have had to deal with unclean drinking water for, for a number of years? It's very important. After decades of continued drinking water advisories, despite numerous promises from the federal government to resolve them, First Nations will finally have both compensation for their past harms and moving forward. Uh, the settlement will provide compensation for past harms such as health impacts, cultural degradation and inconvenience. Um, it will also be structured to provide forward-looking relief. It will guarantee class members a clean water source, whether it's through improved infrastructure, such as for Curve Lake First Station, who wishes for uh, their community to have a new water treatment plant, uh, or a new water source, such as Tatasquiat Cree Nation, who wishes for their community to draw their water from Ashian Lake. Uh, impacted First Nations will finally have access to the quality and quantity 
uh, of clean drinking water comparable to non-Indigenous communities, something that they have been advocating for for decades. So is there a new deadline for when boil water advisories uh, will be lifted in these communities with this agreement? So the agreement in principle contains a renewed commitment to Canada's action plan for ending long-term drinking water advisories. The commitment will be a term of the settlement which will ensure that it's enforceable. Precise me mechanism of enforcement will be resolved in the settlement agreement. Um, as discussed, the focus of the agreement is broader than long-term drinking water advisories, which represent an extreme situation in which regular access to clean water is interrupted for more than one year. The aim of this is to ensure that class members will have the kind of regular access to drinking water in their homes that most Canadians take for granted, and that they do not lurch from one crisis to another. In order to achieve this, appropriate solutions will need to be identified and properly implemented. So while I cannot provide an exact date at this time, I can say that the agreement has brought the parties to the table together and will bring resolution far faster than I expect it would otherwise be reached. And it will ensure that that commitment is met. And Stephanie, along with the money going to those affected by poor water quality, uh, what other supports are in the agreement that are gonna help these First Nations? Canada will pay $1.5 in compensation for individuals deprived of clean drinking water. That is for cultural health and other impacts. There will also be a $400 million First Nation Economic and Cultural Restoration Fund created. There will also be modernization of Canada's First Nations drinking water legislation. There will also be the creation of a First Nations Advisory Committee on Safe Drinking Water. And there will be supports for First Nations to develop their own safe drinking water bylaws and initiatives, to name a few things. All right, Stephanie, we're going to have to end it there. I, I want to thank you for taking a few minutes to speak with us today. Thanks so much. A Winnipeg sporting complex could act as a shelter for hundreds of First Nation evacuees. The complex at the University of Winnipeg has been set up by the Canadian Red Cross as a place to house evacuated people due to forest fires in Manitoba. The Red Cross team has set up cots inside the complex, which can temporarily house five to 600 people. The funding support comes from Indigenous Services Canada, as fires rage through northern Manitoba and over 3,000 people have been evacuated from communities. Red Cross spokesperson Jason Small says, right now there's still hotel space for many evacuees and the shelter acts as a last resort. That's our hope, you know, with this situation, even if people have friends and family to go to, that's another option. This, to us, this is the last option. We really hope that we don't have to use this. After a brief period of respite for firefighters in British Columbia, things are heating up once again. 292 fires are burning across the province. Thousands of residents are being told they may have to leave at a moment's notice. Officials are particularly concerned about the White Rock Lake wildfire between Kamloops and Vernon. It covers about 32,000 hectares or more than double the size of the city of Vancouver. Nearly 700 properties are under evacuation order and another 3,000 are under evacuation alert. Meanwhile, we're learning more about the damage estimate after a wildfire destroyed the village of Lytton, B.C. on June 30th. With 300 reported claims so far, the Insurance Bureau of Canada pegs the figure at $78 million. Two people were killed in that fire, and the cause is still under investigation. All right, it's time for one final break, but don't go anywhere. You're going to want to see today's photo of the day. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. This is a once in a lifetime shot by APTN's Lee Wilson. He captured this picture of an eagle flying away with its prey in, in BC. If you have pictures you want us to share, send them our way for a chance to be featured on APTN National News. Email, email them to share at aptn.ca along with the location and some info. All right, let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting in the east, 24 in rain in Charlottetown and 22 in rain in Halifax. 13 in rain in Nain and 28 in rain in Cartwright. 27 in a mix of sun and cloud in Quebec City and 30 in Montreal. 28 in a mix of sun and cloud in Toronto and 30 in sunshine in Sarnia. 23 in rain in Timmins and 21 in Big Trout Lake. 
15 in Amixa Sun and Cloud in Churchill and 22 in Thompson. 27 in Sunshine in Winnipeg and 26 in Brandon. Rain and 29 degrees in Regina and 30 in rain in Saskatoon. More range in Buffalo Narrows and 25 degrees and 24 in sun in Stony Rapids. More rain over in the west, 26 in rain in Fort McMurray and 21 in rain in Peace River. 27 in rain in Calgary and rain in 24 in Edmonton. 23 in a mix of sun and cloud in Victoria and 20 in rain in Bella Coola. Rain and 18 degrees in Fort Nelson and 17 in Smithers. A mix of sun and cloud and 25 in Mail and 20 in rain in Rock River. A mix of sun and cloud and 22 in Yellowknife and 23 in rain in Wrigley. 13 degrees in Colville Lake and 22 in Fort McPherson. 15 in a mix of sun and cloud in Baker Lake and 15 in Chesterfield. 8 degrees in a mix of sun and cloud in Resolute and 8 degrees in Arctic Bay. Ottawa's future central library, library is getting a new name. When built, it, it will be known by an Anishinaabe Moan word. The name unveiled earlier today is Otasoke. The $192 million building will also house the National Archives of Canada. Right now, the foundation is still being dug out, but the facility is expected to be ready for the public in 2024. A member of the Gidigan Zibi First Nation explained the English meaning of the name. So the name that we honor Ottawa with in our language for this new facility is called storytelling in English. So I now mean Nigamiguen, Nimiguen on on Ionos when we give this name Adesoke. We are launching it now. So the name of this facility is called Adesoke Storytelling. Miguetch. And the name Adesoke is a meaningful reflection on the importance of coming together to share our stories and more importantly to learn from one another. A new store launched in Winnipeg is just getting off the ground. Turtle Woman Indigenous Wear is the brainchild of April Toy Pesum, a Barren Lands First Nation beater and seamstress. Her store's model of bringing the native back is reflected on the shelves and displays. She designs and makes ribbon skirts, shirts and other powwow regalia. The store buys from other indigenous artists and promotes indigenous, indigenous design. She will also supply ribbon, beads, and other supplies, and says that's why she wanted to start the shop. Well, most of our stuff is um, handmade. Um, we have a lot of bells. We have a lot of um, powwow regalia, you know, the bells and the hair ties that go with it, the jingle dresses. And we also have ribbon skirts that are all handmade, and uh, we do take custom orders. So, you know, if somebody can't find a size or a color, then absolutely we will customize their... Um, a ribbon skirt or ribbon shirt. You can check out her Facebook page at Turtle Woman Indigenous Wear. That now makes a couple of indigenous clothing stores here in Winnipeg, which is great. The exposure these stores and also the artists are getting is fantastic to see. That's our show for this Thursday edition of APTN National News. For news anytime, you can visit our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Have a great night.